came from God, the world to save. I brought them wisdom from above, worship and liberty and love. They slew me, so be my grave without a name, that earth may swallow up my shame. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Do You Believe? Thanks so much for joining me tonight. So tonight we have a great show and I have an awesome guest with me tonight. I have Jason Telto and we're going to be talking about cults and Alistair Crowley and a couple of the other cults. Jason, hey, thanks so much for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me on again. Oh my God. I love having you on the show. Um, thanks so much. Okay. So Jason, yes. oh, and everybody, please, uh, would you please subscribe and give us a like to the video? We'd really appreciate it. Jason. Yes, ma'am. Let's talk about a couple of the cults, but can we start off with Alistair Crowley? All righty. Well, the main thing with Alistair is that a lot of people don't actually know was he was born to his mother and a father who was actually a minister. And he was very religious, uh, heavy into God, up until the point that he was 11. And at that time, his dad had died, and that's where he completely changed. He changed in which way? He completely got so angry with God, he completely uh, converted his entire belief system. And at that point in his life, he himself believed to become the great beast. And is that when he referred to himself as 666? Yes. Awesome. Wow. Now, he, um, he, he was educated, wasn't he? He went to... Um... Yeah. Cambridge, I believe. Yeah, it yeah, Cambridge. Now he's also been known as the wickedest man in the world, and right, I, I, he relished that title. Yeah, I guess the English, uh, uh, the Britons uh, disowned him. I guess he embarrassed uh, the Britons. Well, how that came about was uh, during World War II, he had come to America, living in New York, and started giving Nazi propag uh, propaganda out. And he claimed that he was doing it so that he would be so outrageous that it would make the Nazis look bad. But inadvertently, it just made the Britons so mad that they just completely denounced him. Now, he, he was into, um, well, he, he was into black magic. He was a drug fiend. And he was also a sex addict. Sex now, addict. And right. that came to be one of the main things that he... Uh, really focused on. And in 1920, he founded a, a commune and he called it an abbey in Sicily. Yes. Um, let's go back just a second. Oh, sure. To, he, uh, he was getting into the magic arts, not yet black magic, but he was, when he was a student at Cambridge, he was looking to fulfill his magic needs and he came across uh, a sect called the golden dawn and he got into them and was starting to learn but he got so irritated with them because he thought they were more or less just playing around with it and that's when he delved deeper into the black magic and he took over the golden dawn oh he did take it over yes oh they didn't like him no not at all <laughs> So then, so then, um, so then, and I, I understand that Bram Stoker also was involved in that, uh, Golden Dawn and a couple of yes. other famous people. Yes. Cause it was an exclusive membership of the occult. Exactly. Uh, so then, then, um, in 19, so I guess in 1920 is when he founded that commune, um, or Abbey in Sicily. Yes. Well, and, um, it wasn't until probably, I want to get this right, the late 70s, that it was actually found. Because it was more or less at that time, before that, a, a urban legend, I guess you could say. Um, 
people always heard about it, but nobody could ever find it. And then because it was buried way deep in the woods. Yes. Uh, and then they finally found it. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Kirk Hammett, I believe, has purchased it from Metallica, the metal band. Oh, you know, I was reading something about that. I did happen to find a picture, Jason, uh, of the Abbey. Um, after, I mean, it's been abandoned for so long and it's just crumbling and falling apart. And I am showing the viewers, viewers a picture of the Abbey. Um, and then also inside of that Abbey, there was fresco. They call fresco paintings on the walls. Yes. And I understand a lot of it was uh, pornographic. Yes, very. And it was, and, and even to this day, people still seek this place out and go in and perform their own rituals and do all sorts of things in there of de just sheer depravity. Yeah. Because that's really what Alistair was about. He, you know, he wasn't per se like a Satan worshiper because in his mind he was Lucifer. He was the great beast. And uh, his, his only mantra was, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And in like his books and everything, he would teach you how to train yourself to think differently and to do things differently. And you would have to learn to read backwards and listen to music backwards to do everything opposite of what man has taught you and trained you to do. Mm. And he basically that is where his cult status would come into because that is the epitome of cult where you are training someone's mind to think differently than the populace. Now he wanted to sweep away Christianity. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, he was just, he hated everything that had to do with Christianity, but more so he just hated everything that had to do with anything. I mean, he said, if you want to rape, rape, if you want to murder, murder, you know, just do whatever your natural instincts are. Now, Jason, um, he was kicked out of Sicily because of the reports of human and animal sacrifices. Correct. And, and they said imaginable sexual depravity. If you can yeah, imagine. He, he actually got gonorrhea, if I may say that. Um, <laughs> he, he was married and had a child uh, during this time. And, but he was still, you know, you just do what you want. And he was completely addicted to sex. Um, he, how can I put this without, um, basically by the time it got to the end of it all and you look back, it was all based on his ad addiction for sex. Uh, there was a lot of talk about things he had done, but nothing could really be substantiated other than uh, drug use, sex, um, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Now he wanted to um, he wanted to perform this. I guess it's the ultra black magic ritual called Albra Melon. Yes, and it dates back to the 14th century. Yeah, he actually went to Egypt with his wife to perform this, um, but he never actually completed the ritual. Um, things happened and uh, his wife and child actually were murdered or not murdered, but killed or died. And he never performed that ritual, but he did eventually end up in Egypt and went into a tomb of a king where he did perform another ritual. Uh, the uh, I can't remember what it's called. It starts with a G. Uh, but that is where he felt that the spirits finally completely gave themselves over to him. Is this when he started to become, have a possession of demonic presence? Yes. Okay. Now, he also, because he wanted to practice this black magic ritual, he wanted a location where he could do this for about six months and do nothing at all, but do this black magic in this house. Now I have a picture of the house that he, um, that he purchased. Um, 
Oh gosh, wait a minute. I can't see because it's so small. Let me see if I can find that house. It was in uh, Loch Ness. Yes. Yes. Um, Bullskin House in, in Loch Ness, Scotland. And even today, there are still people going up there and performing rituals as well. And there's modern uh, graffiti, uh, a lot of phallic symbols, uh, uh, talk, written talk about cocaine, which apparently was a big thing for him. Huh. So he, so he, he, he started up on, on his um, path to do six months of this uh, ritual over there. And, um, and, the, and it was to conjure up, I guess, master demons. And yes. this ritual is one of the, it's, it's like a, a taboo to do. It's extremely, extremely dangerous, and it does conjure up extremely dangerous spirits. And, and if that ritual did go wrong, they said, yeah, you would become possessed. Um, now, he also thought in doing this that he could conjure up his guardian angel. And, um, and, but in doing this, you also conjure up other spirits. The other spirits have to be released. And then what, he just gave up? He gave up doing that? Yeah, because at that point in his life, the main reason he had just stopped was because no longer was it important for him to be calling upon deities because now in, within his mind, he was the ultimate deity. Uh -huh. Now, he also um, said that he had exposed himself to every disease, accident, and violence that you could imagine. He also consumed human excrement and human yes. flesh. Yes. So he was, a, he was a cannibal? I'm sure he didn't picture himself in that mindset, but for all intents, yes, absolutely. Uh, he dove into doing every taboo uh, ritual occurrence he could possibly imagine. Oh, my God. Um, he also um, is the key, key figure in a cult. He's the icon of rebellion, and um, he's just pure evil, pure evil. And he, was, he said he was a crusader for Christ. At, at one time, and, and see, the problem... The main part where the cult comes in on him was through his death in 47 on, he was more or less forgotten about until the 60s revolution. And that's when you had people like Jim Morrison, John Lennon, uh, Jimmy Page. You had all these really well-known public figures that kind of picked up his torch and really brought him back into the spotlight. Uh, on Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band by the Beatles, uh -huh. he's on the front cover. On the doors, he's on the back cover, and they're all uh, circling a bust of him. And it was all from that whole, whatever makes you happy, whatever you want to do, just do it. But they didn't really understand where he was coming from originally. So it kind of had a backfiring part where... You had these people that saw him as a great man, but they didn't want to look at the evil that he actually was. Oh my God. I understand the horrible things that they used to do. And they, and they, they were getting involved with having sex with animals. He wanted, uh, this is what I, I, I read. He, he, it, I guess I could say it. I don't know. It's kind of hard to talk about. He wanted women to, he wanted them to have sex and, and a goat would be there. And while the woman climaxed, they wanted right. to slit the throat of the, throat of, the, of goat. the goat. Yeah. Yes. Now was she having sex with the goat or was the goat just there? Uh, that she was, yes. Having sex with the goat. That's what yes. he, that's, that. Isn't that great? That's what he wanted. Um, they did all kinds of um, horrible things behind closed doors. Um, now, he, he also published poetry, disgusting pornographic poetry. Yes, he, but he had to do it abroad, and he did it under a different name uh, because it was illegal where he was at. Right. Well, I think anywhere 
anywhere it would be considered obscene and <laughs> I don't think it would have been published. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bad, really bad stuff and I, we shouldn't laugh. Um, yes, yeah, so he had a horrible appetite, just a horrible appetite for sex. He had a compulsion for sin and, and like again, he was fascinated with the magic and the occult. Now, there was, um, what else can you tell us about, um, about Alistair McCoy? Alistair Crawley. Um, really, uh, he, you know, aside from what we've already said, you know, he, he died believing himself to be the great beast, the, you know, the Antichrist himself. Um, he died penniless. And uh, now he, he had, did. he had, when he was 21, he inherited a trust fund, which would have been a lot of money. It was a lot of money. The family and was that's wealthy. what allowed him to really, you know, give up everything and just pursue his own wicked wants. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so he was, he didn't have to worry about finances. And I imagine um, the abbey that he bought and, and also the house in, um, now, did he own that house in uh, Loch Ness or was he just renting it? He did own it. Oh, he did own it. Yes. Oh, I see. And so what did he do with all his money? I'm sure that a lot of it, you know, went to vices, obviously. Um, and drugs. Now, yeah, drugs, prostitution, uh, all, everything. Now, whatever happened to it when he died, I'm not sure. Um, well, he didn't have any money. So after, okay, look, so after the Abbey... Uh, and 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 the house in Loch Ness. Where did he go from there? Where was he practicing his black magic? Uh, mainly in Loch Ness, most of all. But he would travel uh, extensively, which is where a lot of his money went to. Uh, like I said, he went to Egypt. He went to um, Scotland. He went, you know, all over. Just basically in his mind, you know, spreading his message. And as he would go, he would pick up these followers. Mm -hmm. Did they stick with him or did they finally leave him? They stuck with him to the end. They did? They did. They they believed him to be who he said he was. And, and they, you know, liked his theology because, you know, they were... It gets into the cult realm of the psychology behind cults is... You tell these people what they want to hear, and then you tell them how wonderful they are, they'll follow you anywhere. No matter how unbelievable it may seem to normal people, you know, people that follow cults are normal. They just get lost in the, the romanticism of their leader. Well, aren't people that join cults also, Jason, aren't they looking for something? Their, 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 their family relationship isn't any good. Um, they may not you, go ahead. Usually that is a, uh, the fact. Um, and what you, what I've found out mostly is you talk about people like Jim Jones or David Koresh or any of these leaders, they always came from a broken home. Uh -huh. And so they kind of reach out their hand to like people. So a lot of times you do get people that are searching for something, you know, the, the lower society that feels, you know, the, the people that society looks down upon or people that don't have family or friends or, you know, anybody to really turn to. But then if you look at somebody such as Hitler, you know, he turned an entire nation uh, to his will. So you had all kinds of people that were following that cult. Right. And it, it simply comes from how you brainwash these people to say, okay, this group of people want to do this to you, and you are wonderful. And you just keep praising these people long enough and telling them that these other people hate them, blah, blah, blah. Now they're on your side. Once they're on your side, what you have to do is then you break them down and say that they're worthless and that they're no good, but I can show you how to be a better person. You know, come with me, follow me, and, and, and I will make everything wonderful for, you, wonderful for you. And these people do it because they're, they are looking for something. And more or less brainwashed as well as, yes. as they go along. And they're rewarded by um, their, uh, the friendship, affection. Um, 
and uh, um, some are rewarded with clothes and food and shelter. See, a perfect example of that is Jim Jones. You right. know, they had wonderful health care. They had dental. If you needed clothes, you had it. Uh, you only got a $5 allowance a week, but when everything is paid for, you know, that seems wonderful at the time. So let's talk about Jim Jones since you mentioned him. Okay. Okay. So uh, I know that uh, Jim Jones uh, also in San Francisco on Gary Street, he had a, a, the People's Temple there. People's Temple. Yeah, in San Francisco. He also had one in Indianapolis, and he left Indianapolis. He was he was obsessed with a nuclear attack. And he, I guess he thought by leaving Indianapolis and coming to San Francisco, he'd have a better chance of not he, having that nuclear attack. Yeah. Um, also, what he was seeing there was, see, he grew up with a very racist father. And um, in San Francisco at the time, it was very diverse culture. And so he felt really at home there because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he claimed to love everybody. And within the church, it really was a really diverse culture. You had all kinds of people right. and all races, and cultures and everything. And everybody just loved everybody. and It was just perfect. And and it was so easy for somebody to go in there who was looking for something and see all these different people getting along that they would fall into it so quick. And that's how he got so many followers so quick. Right. Yeah. Right. Now I also, when he was young, when he was younger, he would hold mock church services in his home. Yes. He was very obsessed with religion yeah. and God. Uh, but then his childhood friends also said that, that kind of got skewed because he would do things like he st he was known to stab a cat one day just so he could give it a funeral. Yeah, I know. I know. He he would give funerals to the animals and 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 the people would wonder, his friends would wonder, uh, where are all these animals coming from? Exactly. So, so they assumed that he was killing them, which was really sad. Um yeah, he also was a control freak. He had very a, much so. He was a control freak, and he he also was uh, a sex, loved sex as well. Yes, um, there are reports, I don't want to get too graphic, but after they had moved to uh, Guyana and started up that whole commune, um, it got to the point where he would either request sex from people uh he there was a known time that they were in a business meeting and two ladies were fighting over him and so one of them was made to remove her clothing to see if she was worthy uh he would make people he would pass out enemas to men and women yes so he would have his way with them yes he told the he he told the congregation his members that I want, I don't want any sex between the married couples mm -hmm. and for the wives and for the husbands to please be available for me. Correct. Because and, at first he was known as the father. Right. And then he actually started, you know, wanting them to call him God. And, and they weren't allowed to talk to each other either. Right. Because, and that's how it went so far, I believe, was because, you know, everybody felt uncomfortable as it going on, but nobody was saying anything. Right. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Now, he would also, um, he would also make, um, make the elderly, because he took care of the elderly. If they joined People's Temple, he would take care of them. But the elderly had to sell their homes and give all their money from the sale to him. So in turn, he took care of them. And he, I, I mean, I don't want to make him sound like a hero or anything, but he did take good care of them at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, he, they would sell their house and then come, and they were a big portion of what followed him uh, to Guyana. And... Like I said, they had great health care at the time, and he did take care of them. But 
you know, well, also, as time went on. Also, Jason, let me just add that not only the elderly, but the younger members um, of his group, um, they would go to work outside of the temple. They would earn a paycheck, and they also would turn their paychecks over to Jim Jones. And that's how he got all his money, you know? Oh, yeah, and there were cases where people were up six days straight just working. Yeah. He would, and if they wanted to go to bed, he would make them feel guilty about having to do that, you know? Oh, well, you don't love, you know, God, or you don't love me because you're letting your earthly body try to shut down and get sleep when you should be trying to do the best for the commune. Yeah, now he he was starting to get heavily into drugs as well at this time. Um, now, there was there was uh, some families that were really concerned. Um, okay, so let's, let's, let's move forward a little bit. So now he takes his congregation to Jonestown. Why did he take his congregation to Jonestown? Oh, I know why. Okay, go ahead. You the tell him. That's right. You tell them. Yep. Uh, when he was in San Francisco, uh, they started looking in to see, you know, what exactly was going on, you know, what dealings were happening, and he started getting real nervous. And he's like, you know, we just want to be alone. Please leave me alone. And he started getting on the news. Uh, I think it was Walt. There was some newspaper that was very reputable that really broke that story. And he, finally, he just broke down and said, okay, we're going to go here and we're going to create our own Garden of Eden. Right. Um, now, th there were reports when he was uh, in San Francisco, there were reports. Um, he was reported um, for humiliation and abuse. abuse. And that's yes. also why he wanted to uh, leave the area. And he rented 3,800 acres in Guyana. Uh, to set up his Jonestown there to bring his flock with him. Now, um, and they let's see, in 1974 is when he decided to uh, move there um, and rent that property. And then in 1977, in the summers, when Jim Jones brought himself and his followers there. And it was right. a dream of utopian paradise where race was not important there. And of course, everybody was extremely happy when they first got there. He was wonderful to them. Absolutely. And, you know, because you walk in and everybody's got a smile and everybody's working together and, you know, everybody's equal. And that's what he really wanted to get across was that everybody was equal. And in that world that he had created, it gave that illusion that everybody was aside from him. Right. But he demanded devotion. He just, absolutely. yeah, yeah. He, it was, it was very important that he get that absolute devotion. Now he took away all their passports, medications, and he also censored their mail in, in and out of Guyana. Mm -hmm. and, and they weren't allowed to talk to any family or anything. No. And not only that, some of the people even turned over their kids to him. Mm-hmm. Now, also, they had a big meeting room. I guess they called it the pavilion. And when they would meet, he would um, he would have his little meetings with them. But he tested them all the time by passing out a flavored drink to them and telling them it, there was poison was in poison. it. There was poison. And, and then when they would freak out, he would condemn them for their lack of faith yes right but then when this was their test so when they did go through with it that made him extremely happy because they followed they're following him they're doing what he wanted now mm -hmm. when um while he was there in Guyana, there were family members that were quite concerned about their relatives that were at Jonestown, and they had contacted... Do you want to tell the story? They had contacted uh, Congressman Leo Ryan. Yeah, Leo Ryan, and he flew out there with a news crew. 
And when he got out there, uh, Jim took him around the facility, showed him everything. And that night, the first night, uh, Leo got up on stage and said, I can tell how happy y'all are, how wonderful everything is. Um, you know, this is the way life should really be. And later on that night, though, he got multiple letters from people that had snuck him letters saying, you know, help. Right. It's not that great here. You know, all this is going on. And that's when he decided to help two people defect and get out of there. Well, when they started to leave, mm -hmm. uh, they get to the airplane and they start getting shot at right. by four snipers. Right. right. And uh, most of them died. The pilot got away and I think one other person. Uh, Nancy, yes, there were a couple of other people that were shot multiple times, but they were able to escape. escape yeah. And uh, Leo Ryan and three of the journalists were also killed. Yeah, he was shot 21 times or 22 times, I believe. And one man who was there still in the facility, and this is where it all kind of came to a head, was one man that was in the facility that was part of the, the People's Temple uh, ran off into the jungle and hid. And by this time, Jim knew it was over. Yeah. You know, it was just a matter of days till, you know, it was all going to happen. And that's when he created the cyanide punch. Right. Right. On, on November 17th, when uh, Leo Ryan came out, of course, they killed him. Um, Joan, uh, Jim Jones knew there was going to be a backlash on him. So the next day on the 18th is when they um, got all the, um, the, let me find, I got a picture of that if I can find it. Um, 909 people died that day. Right. That's just an amazing amount of people. Oh gosh. Yes. It, and it was, and the thing is he forced those poor people to, uh, to take that substance. They didn't want to do it. And there was a few that did, but, uh, yeah, after it had all been done and they did autopsies, they found out that, you know, the babies went first, right? The parents had to feed the babies and then the children and then the adults, and some would take it, some were forced to take it at gunpoint, and those that wouldn't even do that were injected. Exactly. Yes. It was horrible. It was just a horrible, horrible thing that was done to those poor people. And, um, and of course, Jim Jones, um, he didn't die from the cyanide. Shot to the head. <laughs> yeah. Now, the, now, they're not sure, though, if he did it or somebody else did it. Correct. Right. Wow. Yeah, that was a horrible thing uh, to happen. Um, now, <clears throat> Jason, have Bohemian Grove. Um, I know somewhat of the Bohemian Grove in, uh, in, uh, in Sonoma County. Mm -hmm. I don't know. If, um, from, what I in, from what I know, because it, it's more or less a local thing, um, <clears throat> It's uh, in the Redwoods, out by the Russian River, and uh, I've never taken a walk back there. I understand it's gorgeous back there, but there's a lot of uh, rich and uh, polit rich people and politicians that belong to this cult at the Bohemian Grove. I just want to talk talk a little bit about it. It's horrendous. It's it goes way back. Do you know? Uh, are you familiar with the Bohemian Grove? Not a lot. Um, I know that, you know, it was the private club and um, their guests would visit and have uh, a lot of notable figures, you know, politicians, people like that. Um, I don't know a whole lot about it, though. There uh, now there has been uh, there's a fellow that went in there and was able to take pictures I was able to find two of the pictures that he was able to take because it's extremely secretive and you, you're not allowed in there if you don't belong to that group. And from what I, and they do, they do ritual killings at this grove. They kill wow. people and they also kill animals. And from what I understand is and I'm showing a picture now. I'm pres it looks like they're uh, set a horse on fire. 
They're horrible. This group is absolutely horrible. And they all sit around and watch a burning animal. And they, and they have to hear the screams. It has to be alive because that's what gives them, that gives them the thrill. They have to hear the animal scream. It's just horrific. And that's all I want to say on that, at uh, the Bohemian Grove. Um, Charles Manson. Want to talk a little bit about Charles Manson? Once again, you're looking at a man who was born to a prostitute mother, his father being a John, never knew his father. Um, so automatically, you know, he was basically set up for self-destruction. Um, early on in his life, he people say Charles Manson never killed anybody, but in fact, he did kill a drug dealer one time that is known. Um, and then he got into uh, be friends with some pretty well-known people. Uh, his best friend at the time being Dennis Wilson, the drummer of the Beach Boys, which comes into play into the main story later. But he, once again, in this 60s time period, he, he also was a fan of Aleister Crowley. Um, but he mainly believed in a race riot was coming. It was just going to be a big against black and white, so he wanted to build his army, is what he was saying. But that is not what he was planning. Uh, a lot of people don't realize how shallow the murders were, how the reason for it. Um, he had built a family, and they lived on the ranch. Uh, and he would send them out to do his bidding, uh, kill whoever. Uh, and a lot of people don't realize that the Sharon Tate LeBianca murders were not meant for them. They just, uh, go ahead. They just happened to be in that house. What happened that a lot of people may not know is he had given a song to Dennis Wilson for the Beach Boys to do. Uh, later done by Guns N' Roses, I might add, but anyway. Um, and Dennis took the song back to the Beach Boys. They said, you know, we're not going to do this. And that was the start of his anger against um, society. Because in his mind, that was a personal rejection. Right. You know, because that's the cult leader mentality. You know, a musician would say, oh, well, I'll go somewhere else and see if they want to do it. To him, it was very personal. It was an attack directly on him. Well, <clears throat> the house that they went to that in one night where Sharon Tate was staying because she was pregnant and her husband, Roman Polanski, was out of town doing a movie. <clears throat> Abigail Folger was there, the heiress to the Folger's coffee, and other people. Well, that used to be Dennis Wilson's house. But unbeknownst to them, he had left years ago. And they went there to kill him. And they just happened to be there. And, you know, the family didn't know why they were killing. They just knew this is the address. Kill everybody there. And that's what they did. I had um, seen an interview with um, the Atkins girl, Susan Atkins. And she said that, they were supposed to go to that block and go to every house and go in and kill everyone on that block. That's what and his... That was, that was Charlie's idea just to cover up who and why mm -hmm. he was doing it. Well, he had... Um, he got permission to live, to bring his uh, followers with him, the family, which was a hippie group that he started in San Francisco... And um, they went to this Spawn Ranch. Now, the fellow allowed Manson to come there and stay on Spawn Ranch. And from there, I believe, is when Charles Manson um, started having his family go out and do the killings for him. Yes. Uh, at the time, you know, the reason the guy let him stay was because, you know, they were just a fun-loving group. You know, they weren't really causing any problems. They'd sit out in the desert and sing and play guitar and you know just have a good time but that's when you know 
Charlie changed, and he really started to believe his hype that he was this great man and that he was sent here to create Helter Skelter. Hmm. Right. Now, um, I have a picture of the of the people that he killed. Um, it was um, uh, Abigail Folger and uh, a, a fella that was driving up the driveway in his car. Um, Tex just went over there and, and blew his brains out. <clears throat> and Sharon Tate and uh, her, her hairdresser. Um, and she was pregnant at the yes, time Yes, well. and she was pregnant. And she begged for her life. And uh, Susan Atkins told her that she was, her words meant nothing to her. They meant nothing. They had no, absolutely no feeling for these people whatsoever. None. None. No, no. Um, and, and that's just that brainwashing. I mean, I'm sure in another skewed reality, these people were probably really nice, good people. I don't. But when you get brainwashed, you know, you're under control of somebody else completely, and you are not who you are. Well, I understand Susan Atkins, before she was brought into the Manson family, that she used to walk the streets of San Francisco. She would go to the bathroom on people's doorsteps. And she also was involved at, with Anton, Anton LaVey, too, at one time. She yes. was in his cult. Do you want, what about, An, oh gosh, what about Anton LaVey? Do you want to talk a little bit about Anton LaVey? Okay, well, Anton started up the Church of Satan in his 60s, um, and basically where he was coming from was you have two different kinds of Satanists. You've got uh, Satanism. You've got the Satanism, which is I believe he is a deity. I believe that the devil is real. And then you have Luciferian, which is more the mindset of that, of do what you want. And LaVey kind of brought them both together in a way that um, he, his whole realm was just, he didn't really believe in Satan as a person, but that you should do what you want, uh, no consequences. Um, if somebody hurts you, you hurt them back. You know, your animal instincts, I guess is the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. um, and he had, I mean, even today, he's got a huge following. Um, yeah, whether the, you can consider him a cult or not, I'm not sure. Just due to the fact that he was in it for himself, and he wasn't really the kind that brainwashed people. He just brought in people with light mindedness, um, if that makes sense. Um, I'm sure that there's a, a, a amount of brainwashing that would go into that, but I mean, religion is religion, whether you agree with it or not. Um, I, I personally don't, but uh, was it a cult to an extent? Mm -hmm. He would have uh, many rituals, uh, not unlike Aleister Crowley. Uh, there was a lot of sex, drugs, alcohol. Uh, there were, you know, they would lay naked women on the altar and, and do... Uh, a snake dance. They would do a snake dance as well. Yeah. Uh, if you want to get a video, anybody out there want to get a video more on him, uh, Satanus, or Satanus is a, a video that actually allowed cameras into the Church of Satan and filmed rituals, you know, filmed everything they had done. And the reason he allowed that was just simply he wanted to show that, you know, they weren't sacrificing babies, they weren't doing this, mm -hmm. they weren't doing that, you know, this is what they were doing. But... You know, and it was right in the middle of, of a nice little town, and you have this one black house, and he had tigers, and, you know, he was just seen as a really weird guy. But once again, the cult way was, I will take in anybody. I accept you for who you are. I accept you because of your faults, not in spite of them. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, they did not, uh, according to... Um, Anton, they did not do any realist, ritualistic sacrifices. Correct. Right. Wow. Oh, we've, it's almost an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. 
Um, there's so many cults out there. It, uh, it's mind boggling how many cults there are out there. Um, yes. Anywhere from religious to, um, to um, uh, political. Oh God, yes. So um, we could go. We could talk all night long on on uh, on uh, a col- on cults. But since uh, we've been on almost an hour, I, I guess I'll have you on the show again, and we'll talk out so- talk about some other cults. There are some other famous okay. ones. Um, there is Heaven's Gate. Um, do you want to just touch on that Heaven's Gate a little bit before we close out? Okay, um, Marshall Applewhite. Uh, he was. It all stemmed from he was gay in a time that it was not good to be gay. And he created this world to try to fool himself. So everybody had to be abstinent. Everybody, you know, he would not force them to be castrated, but he would prefer it. Uh, So everybody could be one, you know, no gender, as if you will. But it all came down to the fact that they, he, they truly believed that when the Hale-Bopp comet was going to fly over, that aliens behind it were going to come, take them up, and take them to the next level of existence. They were and That this they, alien, they were going to beam them up, right? They were going to beam them up correct. into the... To their ship. Now, and he... No, they, oh, just let, let's just t- go back just a little bit. So mm-hmm. the founders were Apple White. Actually, it was um, Bonnie Nettle that he met in the hospital because he had checked himself into a, was it a mental hospital? Yes. Yeah, because of his homosexuality. He wanted it to be rid of. And he was nuts anyway. He There was something, he was not mentally stable. And that's how he met Bonnie. And the two of them became an item. Of course, it was non-sexual. Okay, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to tell the viewers that. Yes, uh, and and when it came to it, this was probably the from what I've studied, this was the least. Um, he would allow the families to talk to their uh, family that were there once a year, and when the parents or whatever of these people said, you know, why can we only talk to you once a year? He said, well, if I was a monk or I was a nun, you wouldn't be allowed to talk to me at all. And he had worked it so it all made perfect sense to them. And, you know, even to this day, there are heaven gate people that did not commit suicide that still believe they are on a higher plane. You know, it it wasn't like Jim Jones or any of this other, you know. They're still followers that believe this to I th- this day. I think they're waiting for um, Apple White to return to them. Return. Yeah. And exactly. actually, Apple White, when they called, he wanted to be called Doe. Doe. And Bonnie wanted to be called T. So that was Doe and T. That's what they ref- the cult members referred to them as. And all the cult members also had their names given to them. They were all, um, their names were all changed. Yes. Yeah. Now, um, go ahead. The creepy thing about this, that when I was doing a little extra studying for the show, Heaven's Gate website is still up. Yes. And the last thing written on there was, this is your last chance to come aboard. And it just, it, it gave me chills to think, you know, that it's still there. And that was the last post made. And to know the next day, they had all also taken a great cyanide drink, just as they did in Jonestown. Well, when, he, when they first started this, their intent wasn't to commit suicide, that they would just, when they die, they would just get beamed up. It, their yes. intent wasn't to commit suicide. No, it was just to go to the next level of right. human consciousness, right. is the way he would put it. Right. And what brought them to the point where he wanted them all to commit suicide. Basically where that came from was simply as it went on uh, and T died and she never came back, he had to rearrange the belief system to fit 
the fact that, you know, when we die, we come back greater. And when she didn't come back, he was like, well, we will come back later on to grab our bodies much later, but we must die and shed this body so we can reach that existence. Mm -hmm. It really related back to that when she died. So then he talked them all into committing suicide and I forget how they, how they committed suicide. I don't have, how did they went from, it was, they started on a Sunday and what they would do is they would take a, a cyanide grape drink. That's right. Lay down. Uh, they all wore the same uniform, as it was called, and then they would be covered over and they would just die. And then the next day, another group would do it, and by Tuesday, the last group finally did it. Right. Now, there was a fella, his real name, I guess, was Richard Ford, and yes. he was sent off to, um, to do some work for Heaven's Gate. But he was contacted by the members that were still alive saying that there would be a door left open in the house for him to get into. And um, I, I believe also they left, the members left tapes. They were very happy. They knew, oh, yes. they were extremely happy. And they really, truly believed, Jason, that they were going to go with these extraterrestrials. That's, they really believed absolutely. it. Absolutely, and I have no doubt that uh, Marshall believed it too by that time. Uh, they really believed it, and yes, they left videos for all their families. He was sent out to be the prophet to explain what they did, and he came in, and he was the one that called 911 and said, I want to report a mass suicide anonymously, um, and he, to this day, is still a member, and he still believes that one day he will reach that next level, and he was in an interview saying, I have no doubt they have finally reached their next level. Isn't so it? he still believes it. Unbelievable. Well, Jason, thank you so much for being on the show with me tonight. I always love having you on. I enjoy it so much. It's uh, always a pleasure. I hope you come back again. I will. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody, that's the show for tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. Let's all say good night to Jason. Jason, good night. Thank you for being with us. And good night to you and yeah, thanks. And everybody, have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much for joining us. Good night, everyone.